Welcome to Cobwebs, everyone. I am your host, Daniel, and as you probably know, I love old vintage horror films. In fact, people have been asking me for more videos, giving me more recommendations of those old spooky movies. So I thought, why don't I do that through the decades? So today we're gonna kick things off by talking about my top 20 horror films of the 1930s. I own most of these on physical media, but a lot of them in big box set collections that aren't a particularly good visual aid. So if I have a good visual aid, I'll show you. Otherwise, I'll just be popping up posters on the screen. So let's go ahead and kick things off at number 20 with The Devil Doll from 1936. Wrongfully convicted of a robbery and murder, Paul Levon breaks out of prison with a genius scientist who has devised a way to shrink human beings. When the scientist dies during the escape, Levon heads for his lab using the shrinking technology to get even with those who framed him and vindicate himself both in the public eye and in the eye of his daughter. So you might already love the universal monsters and we will be talking about a few of those today but as you can see with the devil doll we've got some other stuff too this is actually an mgm horror film not universal and as you can hear from the premise it's wild and weird this is a weird movie with a lot of just crazy stuff going on shrinking people using these tiny little doll people to go and kill people for his revenge i just said the word people a lot but I gotta talk about the star of this movie, who is Lionel Barrymore, who you might know as the antagonist, Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life, but here giving a great and very sympathetic performance as our lead, really protagonist and antagonist at the same time. I really respect the moral ambiguity of this movie, of having our main character do evil things, but still feeling for him. And the movie actually ends on kind of a beautiful, emotional note, which really surprised me. At number 19, Murders in the Zoo from 1933. Dr. Gorman is a millionaire adventurer traveling the world in search of dangerous game. His bored, beautiful, much younger wife entertains herself in the arms of other men, and in turn, Gorman uses his animals to kill them. When a New York City zoo suggests a fundraising gala, Gorman sees a prime opportunity to dispatch his wife's dashing new lover and anyone else who might cross him. Here we've got a Paramount movie, and because it came out in 1933, this is a pre-code horror film. If you talk about old vintage horror movies, you've got to talk about the pre-code ones before the production code really came into effect, which was Hollywood's self-censorship system, so the government didn't get involved in censoring the movies for them. So pre-code horror films are just a little bit meaner, more violent, usually a little bit more sexual than the horror films would be after the fact until around the 1950s, 60s. Murders in the Zoo is another wild, crazy horror movie with a really good lead performance, this time Lionel Atwell as our main character, but also antagonist. Lionel Atwell's kind of like the other guy of Universal Monsters. You've got Karloff, Lugosi, Chaney, and then you've got Lionel Atwell over there in a ton of Universal Monsters movies. And this movie is a series of pretty wild deaths of Lionel Atwell dispatching various people using his animal animals, including a crocodile kill that's really fun. Murders in the Zoo is a good time. At number 18, Mark of the Vampire from 1935. Lionel Barrymore plays a local professor called in to investigate the strange murder of Sir Carell, who died with puncture marks in his neck and his body drained of blood. Soon, Sir Carnell's daughter and would-be son-in-law are also victims of apparent vampire attacks, as the professor's investigation takes him to a haunted castle where deadly creatures of the night are said to reside. The mystery he uncovers in the castle Castle's dark catacombs involves much more than legendary monsters. Yes, Mark of the Vampire also stars Lionel Barrymore from The Devil Doll, and it's also directed by Todd Browning. Both those films are. Todd Browning's gonna show up a good bit on this list. He was a pretty legendary silent film director and made a lot in the 30s as well. If you're like me and you always wish Bela Lugosi did some Dracula sequels, which he never really did, you might really enjoy Mark of the Vampire because it plays very much like a Dracula sequel with Bela Lugosi as a frightening vampire. He's just technically not Dracula. The movie actually plays kind of like a spoof of the 1931 Dracula. Not terribly silly, but just a little bit more over the top and fun and super high energy. In particular, when you look at Lionel Barrymore as the Van Helsing character. Both Bela Lugosi and his daughter, especially his daughter actually, are very creepy vampires. There's a pretty amazing shot of the daughter flying through the air as a bat and then landing. That's a shockingly good effect for the time. I gotta acknowledge this movie has a twist that I don't love and I do think this movie would be that much higher for me 
if we got rid of that twist, but it does solidify this as a kind of fun 1930s Dracula spoof. But speaking of Dracula sequels, at number 17, Dracula's Daughter from 1936. This movie stars Gloria Holden as, you guessed it, Dracula's daughter. She's a vampire countess from Transylvania who seeks a psychiatrist's help to cure her vampire cravings for blood. I used to have a bit of a chip on my shoulder about this movie because I always so wanted an actual Dracula sequel, and that's what this is but it does not have Bela Lugosi or the character of Dracula. You very briefly see Dracula's corpse in a coffin after he got staked by Van Helsing and Dracula, and it's really just a wax dummy. It's not even really Bela Lugosi. But when you take those expectations out of the equation, the movie's actually really good. Gloria Holden is fantastic as our lead vampire, creepy but very sympathetic. While Dracula was pure evil, his daughter is definitely more of a Barnabas Collins or Count Mama Walde from Blackula, kind of a sympathetic, reluctant vampire who wants to get rid of this sickness. The movie also gets a lot of credit for possibly being the first lesbian vampire film because there's a pretty charged scene between Gloria Holden and a young woman that definitely comes across a little bit more Ingrid Pitt than you might expect for the 1930s. This is also considered the last film in the first run of Universal Monsters movies here in 1936 and then they wouldn't make another one until 1939 with the movie we'll talk about a little bit later. At number 16, Island of Lost Souls from 1932. This is another pre-code horror film and an adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel, The Island of Dr. Moreau. In one of his first major movie roles, Charles Lawton is a mad doctor conducting horrifying genetic experiments, turning animals into humanoids on a remote island in the South Seas, much to the fear and disgust of a shipwrecked man who finds himself trapped there. Yes, a very pre-code horror film pretty horrifying actually because well 1930s horror films there's a lot of creepy ideas out there but the idea of turning an animal into a humanoid person who can talk but is still trapped and caged like an animal it's pretty darn horrifying a couple of highlights in the experiments here are Bela Lugosi as an ape man who chants are we not men to lead the other animal people to rebellion and a panther woman who Charles Lawton in a very creepy sexual experiment, tries to get her together with our main shipwrecked man, which is also pretty disturbing if you think about it for five seconds. There have been a few adaptations of that classic H.G. Wells' Dr. Moreau story, but this pre-code horror film pretty darn creepy, especially for its time. At number 15, The Old Dark House from 1932. Seeking shelter from a relentless rainstorm and landslides in a remote region of Wales, five travelers are admitted to a large foreboding old house that belongs to an extremely strange family. This one's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's the first film on the list directed by James Whale, who I would say is the greatest, most important horror director of the 1930s. And this film, The Old Dark House, is one of the greatest examples of the subgenre old dark house movies. Classic old dark house movies are stories of travelers who get stranded because of a storm and have to go up to the creepy house and stay the night to wait until morning. And while they're there, creepy stuff happens. That's exactly what this movie is, but it's also maybe as much comedy as it is horror. Very fun. James Whale had a great sense of humor. and This is, I don't know, might be his funniest horror movie. It's a really great time. It's also got Charles Lawton and it's got Boris Karloff as a creepy manservant who is kind of going for a Frankenstein-like performance. At number 14, the return for the Universal Monsters after Dracula's daughter in 1936, this one is Son of Frankenstein from 1939. A son of the late Dr. Henry Frankenstein finds his father's monstrous creation in a coma and revives him only to find out the monster is controlled by Igor, who is bent on revenge. So this is the third film in the Universal Monsters Frankenstein series, and while this never gets as much credit as the first two do, it's pretty darn deserving of it. This is a great horror movie, a great sequel, continuing the story from Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein. I think it was a fantastic idea to pick up with Dr. Frankenstein's son. Basil Rathbone is a phenomenal replacement for Colin Clive, maybe even a, a better, more mad and crazed mad scientist. He starts out the movie very normal. He's got a wife and kid. He moves into his family's estate and slowly gets drawn into the mad creations of of Dr. Frankenstein. Now I acknowledge some people find this one a little disappointing because Boris Karloff's performance takes steps back from Bride of Frankenstein. He no longer talks. He's a less interesting character than in that second film. But 
Bella Lugosi as Yigor is secretly the star of the show. Some people say this is Bella Lugosi's greatest performance he ever gave, and it's hard to argue. He is amazing in this electric, scary, gross, off-putting, just as good as it gets. At number 13, we've got Dr. X from 1932. A New York newspaper man investigates one of the moon killer murders in which the victims are strangled, cannibalized, and surgically incised under the light of the full moon. The trail leads to a cliffside manner of Dr. Xavier, where the doctor and his colleagues conduct a strange experiment to discover the true identity of the killer. So this is one of a few horror films that Michael Curtiz made for Warner Brothers in the early 30s. Michael Curtiz, a legendary director of stuff like Casablanca, White Christmas, The Adventures of Robin Hood, but he proved here that he could do anything. He could make a darn good horror movie as well. Warner Brothers really tried to balance their horror with comedy, and this one definitely does too. So in addition to the spooky stuff, you've also got a lot of wacky newspaper hijinks, but Dr. X, I think, is the best example of that of all the ones that I've seen. But when it comes to the horror, this is probably the first cannibalistic horror film because the moon killer in this movie is a cannibal, which is pretty darn horrifying. And the best bit of horror goodness you get here is when the killer reveals himself and reveals a scientific technology he has created called synthetic flesh. And he uses the synthetic flesh to form his face into a monstrous form. And I just could not believe what I was looking at when I saw this movie. Like, it's something out of a David Cronenberg movie from the 80s, not something from the 1930s. Really ahead of its time, pretty darn scary. And the fact that this is actually a very early version of a color movie makes it all the more unsettling. At number 12, The Hound of the Baskervilles from 1939. Upon his uncle's death, Sir Henry Baskerville returns from Canada to take charge of the ancestral hall on the desolate moors of Devonshire, and finds that Sherlock Holmes is there to investigate the local belief that his uncle was killed by a monster hound that has roamed the moor since 1650 and is likely to strike again at Sir Henry. So this is one of the many films starring Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes, the first one actually, a series I'm a big fan of and I actually did a video ranking every single Basil Rathbone Sherlock Holmes movie, so you can check that out on the channel. And I'm sure some people might say this is not a horror movie, it's just a mystery, but I think think of all the Sherlock Holmes stories, The Hound of the Baskervilles fits very well into the horror genre, with a monstrous hound roaming the foggy, spooky moors. The atmosphere of the movie is just classic Universal Monsters, even though this is not a Universal film, and it just looks so creepy, and Basil Rathbone is my favorite Sherlock Holmes. He's so good in this. At number 11, The Cat and the Canary from 1939. Ten years after the death of millionaire Cyrus Norman, his will is to be read out to his six relatives at Norman's eerie New Orleans Gothic mansion. During the reading, the superstitious housekeeper declares that someone will be dead by midnight. Our main character, Wally, fears for the beautiful Joyce when she is declared the sole inheritor, and all are alarmed when one of them turns up dead. So this is actually a remake of a 1927 silent film and based on a 1922 play. And this also fits very well into the old dark house genre, and it's absolutely one of my favorites. I love this movie. It's a great horror comedy starring Bob Hope as the lead character, an old comedian that I definitely enjoy in movies. And I think he's very funny in this, extremely charming. And our female lead is Paulette Goddard, who was actually the wife of Charlie Chaplin for a long time. And she just could not be more gorgeous and charming. I love them as a pair in this movie. Amazing gothic atmosphere, great intrigue around the murders that are happening, and actually a pretty creepy killer when he's finally revealed. Cracking into the top 10, we've got the Black Cat from 1934. After a road accident in Hungary, the American honeymooners Joan and Peter and a mysterious Dr. Waldergast find refuge in the house of a famed architect who shares a dark past with the doctor. So the Black Cat is an adaptation of Edgar Allan Poe's The Black Cat, at least so it claims, but not really. It has nothing to do with Poe at all. And it's also one of the last pre-code horror films coming out in 1934, right before the production code really started getting enforced. And it makes all the use of that that it can. The film is one of the many collaborations between the two most legendary horror actors of this time period, Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi. And of all their collaborations, this one is my favorite. At first, you're not sure whose side you're on. They're both pretty creepy. But interestingly enough, Bela Lugosi really gets revealed to be the hero of this movie, which he so rarely got to do. And Boris Karloff is a just horrifyingly evil person in so many ways. And when you get to the final showdown between these two characters, it's way, way more 
violent than you would expect in a creaky old black and white horror movie, including skinning someone alive? It's nuts. You got to see this. At number nine, Todd Browning's Freaks from 1932. A circus's beautiful trapeze artist agrees to marry the leader of sideshow performers, but his deformed friends discover she is only marrying him for his inheritance and act out some brutal revenge. Freaks is one of the greatest carnival set horror films ever made. I absolutely love this movie. It's disturbing in many ways, but I also find it to be an extremely empathetic movie. This movie takes the bold stance to make the sideshow performers, or as the title calls them, freaks, into our real protagonists, the people that we feel for the most. And when we get to see them act out revenge, it's so satisfying because the people they're doing it against are so horrible. We just hate them so, so much. The film is a fascinating relic of a time when there actually were sideshow performers and they were actually used for this movie, which means the stuff about the making of the film is even more interesting possibly than the film itself. But the film itself is great. I love it. It's definitely one of Todd Browning's best movies he ever made. At number eight, we're back with the Universal Monsters with The Mummy from 1932. An ancient Egyptian priest called Imhotep is revived when an archaeological expedition finds his mummy and one of the archaeologists accidentally reads an ancient life-giving spell. Imhotep escapes from the site and searches for the reincarnation of his lost love. Directed by Carl Freund, The Mummy is definitely one of the classic Universal Monsters movies, but often gets less respect than a lot of them, and for whatever reason, I love this movie. I love it so much. I, as much as it is a classic, I feel like it's underrated. The movie often gets criticized for only having one scene of a traditional looking mummy monster just at the very beginning, but that's totally fine with me because there are so many other mummy movies where you watch a wrapped up mummy monster stumble around, strangle people to death, just being a monster throughout. Instead, after that scene, you get to see Boris Karloff as an actual speaking, thinking character, and the movie turns out to actually be a very fascinating gothic romance between Boris Karloff and a woman who I actually think is the most interesting female lead of all the Universal Monsters movies. The film is extremely dark and morbid and romantic all at the same time. At number seven, we're actually sticking with the same director. This is Mad Love from 1935. Peter Lorre stars as an insane surgeon whose obsession with an actress leads him to replace her wounded pianist husband's hands with the hands of a knife murder. Hands which still have the urge to kill. Even if you just look at Looney Tunes, Peter Lorre is one of the most legendary horror actors of all time, and this was actually his American film debut. This movie is so fascinating. He gives such a great performance as an absolute madman, completely obsessed with this woman and will do anything to get her. And you gotta shout out Colin Clive as her husband. Yes, Dr. Frankenstein himself. I've seen a lot of movies that are about replacing someone's body part with the body part of a murderer and it leads them to be a killer. And this is one of the first that I've ever seen, and it is a phenomenal example of it. If you haven't seen Mad Love, I think it's actually one of the most underseen, underrated horror films of the whole black and white era. At number six, James Whale is back with The Invisible Man from 1933. A scientist named Jack Griffin finds a way of making himself invisible, but cannot change himself back. His fiance Flora goes out searching for him and finds that the invisibility has turned him murderously insane. Boris Karloff was definitely Universal's biggest star at this time, and they really wanted him to play the Invisible Man, but the role ended up going to Claude Rains, who of course would go on to be one of the most legendary actors in old Hollywood, in films like Casablanca and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. But here, in pretty much just a vocal performance, as the Invisible Man does stay invisible for the entire film, Claude Rains is incredible and cements himself as one of the best Universal monsters. I love the look of this character so much. Well, look at this character, that's kind of ironic. But when he's got the bandages wrapped up on his face and everything, it's so good, he looks so cool, and the movie has a fantastic sense of humor. Being directed by James Whale, of course it does. It's actually very funny, while also being one of the most demented. You've also got to shout out the special effects in this movie. Unbelievable for their time. Like, they almost totally hold up. 1933, and the invisibility effects in this are truly astounding. Cracking into the top five, we've got King Kong from 1933. 1933. This film follows a filmmaker, a young actress, and the crew of a ship as they travel across the ocean to Skull Island to film the unusual wonders of nature. But much to their surprise, they find the island is inhabited by prehistoric monsters, including the great and iconic monster, 
Kong. King Kong is still one of the most beloved and relevant monsters in all of pop culture history. King Kong continues to be a powerhouse for films, even to this day. There's a new King Kong movie coming out this very year, but this one from 1933, it's still my very favorite. Look, the special effects absolutely blow me away. I love the stop motion Kong, his fights with the dinosaurs, like, you know, CGI is very impressive. It looks more realistic than this, but something about the tangibility of the stop motion effects in this. I, I love it so much. This movie makes me so happy. But unlike a lot of other giant monster movies that are out there, the human stuff is still great and still very interesting. You gotta love Faye Ray as the lead in this movie, one of the original Scream Queens, and she is the beauty that killed the beast. That's, that, that's a famous line in this movie, but it, it sounds really cliche to say right now, especially in a YouTube video. At number four, The Bride of Frankenstein from 1935. Bride of Frankenstein begins where the original Frankenstein left off with Dr. Frankenstein wanting to get away from his mad experiments. Yet when his wife is kidnapped by the monster, Dr. Frankenstein and the mysterious Dr. Pretorius agree to help create him a new monster, this time, a woman. By a lot of people, this is considered to be the best of all Universal Monsters films, and it's easy to see why. It's really, really great. I love how this is a sequel that progresses things beyond the first movie, with the monster actually growing in intelligence and developing as a character. This time he can talk, he's got feelings and thoughts, he can articulate, he can make friends, he can be hurt by people, and it's just so interesting, and Boris Karloff really just... He's one of the best characters in all of the horror genre, and it's more because of this movie than even the first one. The film has some amazing imagery when it comes to the woods that he runs through and how the townspeople torture and attack him. And Elsa Lanchester as the Bride of Frankenstein, though not in this movie very much, is one of the most iconic images in all of cinema history. It's just too bad her and the monster couldn't make it work. They, they just would have made such a cute couple. Before we go into the top three, here's just a few honorable mentions. The from 1935, another sort of Edgar Allan Poe movie starring Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff, a film so weird and demented that the British film censors announced that they would no longer allow American horror films in their country. Mystery of the Wax Museum, another totally solid Michael Curtiz horror film that I admit would go on to be made much better by Vincent Price in the 50s. And Fritz Lang's M, which some people might be expecting to be on the list. To me, it's not so much a horror movie and more of a drama and social message kind of a movie. And while it's very influential and on a technical level, pretty groundbreaking, it's not a personal favorite for me. At number three, we've got Dracula from 1931. A powerful and ruthless vampire arrives in London to prey on young socialite women. Standing in the vampire's way is Jonathan Harker and Dr. Abraham Van Helsing. This is the beginning of universal horror in the sound era. Dracula is the first movie I can remember being obsessed with in my life. It was my favorite universal Monsters movie when I was a kid. As a result, it's just so important to me. I hear the criticisms. People say it's a little bit slow. It's a little bit stagey. To me, none of that really matters. I absolutely love this film. The atmosphere in Transylvania, I think, is the greatest gothic atmosphere that's ever been committed to film. Bela Lugosi is the perfect Dracula. So iconic. It, anytime anyone thinks of a typical version of Dracula, they're not imagining any other actor but Bela Lugosi. He set the standard for what Dracula is, and he deserved it because the performance is beyond iconic. And Dwight Fry as Renfield. I mean, come on, amazing. But at number two is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde from 1931. Dr. Henry Jekyll believes that there are two different sides to men, a good and an evil side. He believes that by separating the two, man can become liberated, and he succeeds in this experiment and accomplishes transforming into to Mr. Hyde, his evil side that will commit horrendous crimes. But when he realizes he should stop using the drug, it's already too late. In the same year Universal was kicking off the Universal Monsters films, Paramount made a film that is as good, if not better. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is an incredible horror film and is my pick for the most pre-code a horror film ever was. This is a brutal, violent, and incredibly sexual version of the story. And I think it actually improves on the book because the book, it explores the evil side of men all through violence. 
and not through sexual desire. And that's where this film takes the idea and runs with it, where Mr. Hyde's relationship with Marianne Hopkins' character is truly disturbing, a romantic relationship built on violence and brutality. Mr. Hyde, there's nothing fun about him, like you might have fun with the Frankenstein monster. He's truly chilling and horrifying. And Frederick March's performance as both Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is one of the best performances I've ever seen. Unrecognizable between the two sides. And it's actually one of the only times in history that an actor would would win an Oscar for a horror film. But at number one, I think is one of the best movies ever made. This is Frankenstein from 1931. The most legendary adaptation of Mary Shelley's novel, Dr. Frankenstein dares to tamper with life and death by creating a human monster out of lifeless body parts. But the doctor's dreams are shattered by his creation's violent rage as the monster wakes to a world in which he is unwelcome. Much like when your average person thinks of Dracula, they will think of Bela Lugosi when your average person thinks of Frankenstein's monster, they're going to think of Boris Karloff in this incredible makeup that Jack Pierce just made up, which is like astounding because to our world today, the design is synonymous with the word Frankenstein. It's what everybody thinks of, but it's just something that Jack Pierce came up with for this movie. And it's mind blowing. I think it's the greatest design for any monster ever in any movie ever, ever, ever. Boris Karloff's performance though elevates it that much more by being truly sympathetic, but also truly chilling as he really does feel like something non-human, something that's not supposed to be here. He really feels like a broken, sad creature that you fear, but sympathize with and kind of want to hang out with too, because he just seems cool. Colin Clive is Dr. Frankenstein. I love him. He's not the best Dr. Frankenstein, but he's great. And the sets in this movie are some of the best and most iconic in cinema history. The graveyard, the laboratory, everything in this movie looks amazing. Universal Monsters movies, they did more than build sets. They truly created worlds. The sets are huge, expansive, fantastical, but realistic. And it truly feels like stepping into a world that I truly want to live in. That's my list, folks. But if you enjoyed this, check out this playlist right over here. A ton of other spooky horror rankings that I've got over on the channel. And hit subscribe if you haven't yet. And let me know your favorite 1930s horror films down in the comments below. I would love to hear from you. With all that said, don't forget to enjoy yourself today, have some fun, and I will see you next time.